Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We pray our parish patronal prayer. Bless the mark of the archangel. Defend us in this day of battle. Be our safeguard against the weakness and snares of the devil. May God rebuke him and humbly pray. And do thou, O Prince of the heavenly hosts, by the power of Almighty God, cast into hell Satan and all the evil spirits who run throughout the world, seeking their own souls. Have mercy on us. Pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And uh, David, welcome. This is Robert. I don't think you've met Robert. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, so let's get into it, boys. John chapter six. We continue. Last week we got up to just before the climax when Jesus is going to drop the biggest bombshell they've heard. They're comparing Moses to Jesus after he feeds five thousand. They come up to him, and start complaining. What verse um, we're we're going to continue from verse forty nine. So they come to the Lord, Lord, you know, we want to see another sign from you. We want to see a miracle. Moses gave us manna in the desert. What are you going to do? And we spoke about how they're very, it's like they ask for something, but they don't realize, they don't know what they want. Jesus just done the greatest miracle, one of the greatest in history, feeding 5,000 people, men, not including women and children. Yet they dare to come up to him and say, what sign do you do? So we can see how these people, they, they, they're saying something. But they're meaning something else because what they're saying doesn't really make sense, unfortunately. And we're in that scene. Jesus is in Capernaum. He's in a synagogue, actually, when they're confronting him. And we're just going to continue in that um, saying of Jesus to them. So from verse 49. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and they died. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that a man may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh. The Jews disputed among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is food indeed. And my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father. So he who eats me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not such as your fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. This he said in the synagogue as he taught at Capernaum. So this is among his own people. In Capernaum is a city of the Jews. This is unheard of. We're going to continue and now see. They're going to give the feedback of what the disciples thought in the next verse. Many of your disciples, when they heard it, said, This is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples murmured at him, said to them, Do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is of no avail. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life. There were some of you that do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who those were that did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted him by my Father. After this, his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. So we see because of this saying, people are leaving Jesus. This is how intense this saying is. Why, why do you think they left him? I'm going to get there, Father, after I finish um, this part. Um, it, is a, it is a real turning point in the ministry of our Lord. He'd been very popular up until that time, working all these great signs and wonders. But now as he begins to deliver the doctrine on the Holy Eucharist, it's like how Protestants react to Catholic doctrine on the Eucharist. They, they misunderstand us. They think that we... Uh, uh, trying to teach some kind of cannibalism, eat my yeah. body, drink my blood. It's probably ignorance, but also also it shows that they're looking for the wrong thing. They're worldly. They're worldly in their thinking. They want sort of a political messiah who will just give them bread to eat whenever they want. Um, they're not really interested in the spiritual significance of it. Just my birds are getting upset. 
Thanks, Father. Just continuing on, verse 67. Jesus said to the twelve. So Jesus now is approaching the twelve. He's seen all these people saying, okay, they've sort of taken it to heart. They've taken offense. They draw, draw back. They're going away. Then Jesus looks at his twelve. His twelve own disciples. Will you also go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And we have believed and have come to know that you are the Holy One of God. Jesus answered them, Did I not choose you, the twelve? Yet one of you is a devil. And he spoke of Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, for he was one of the twelve who was to betray him. So I mentioned that verse about Judas leaving Jesus at this point in the first year of the public ministry of Christ. His heart sort of left the Lord. And you can see it here, right here in John. That he, can, he took offense also as one of the twelve and didn't really believe. Now we're going to go back and unpack this because I've done a high level overview of what happened so we can understand the chronology of events, what happened, why it happened, short breakdown. But as Father said, you know, one of the things he said was about it relates to the sacrament of the Eucharist, Jesus giving us his actual flesh. Last week I just talked, talked about how Jesus as the bread of life is. The giver of grace. That's one way to look at it. When we go to Jesus, we never hunger for grace because he is the bread, the food of the soul. The scriptures are the food of the soul, catechism says. But also his literal body, literally, is food for our soul in the Eucharist. So, of course, we very turn to the sacramental language of the Lord, which is good. Um, and we do most usually know this as Catholics, which most people who are not Catholics don't know. But I feel most Catholics are ignorant of the grace aspect or the aspect of Jesus speaking holistically, not just as the Eucharist, though it is most certainly in the Eucharist. And we know he's talking about physical eating because the Greek word changes. When he first said, you must eat, so let me get this up. He changes the Greek word about eating his flesh to a word that is a human word for eating, to a word that for animals eating and munching and gnawing, which is trogo. And I'm going to get that up for us now. Where can I find it? We were talking about this last week. Okay. Last week. Yeah, I was, I was yes. about to ask, should we um, chew on the body of Christ? Or? Mm. Oh, yeah. Well, so well, that was last week. We're, 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 we're not. Yeah. You can we're, do we're, we're not. Uh, we're just fun, receiving it. We're not fundamentalists in how we read scripture. So, I mean, we've got to receive our Lord reverently. It's not It's not like sort of eating a steak, you know. It's... it's um, it's given to us under a sacramental form. So, so it's to, to emphasize the point of consuming, eating. But you know, I would just advise in the Roman rite anyway, other, other rites of the church have different kinds of, of Eucharistic bread, to, to just have it placed on your tongue and to let it melt and then consume it. But it's not, not a sin. Not it's not a sin to do it. either. Um, if you don't mind me saying, I just did a quick Google search on that Greek word, trogien. It goes, first, rather than the ordinary Greek term for eating, which is phagien, John has Jesus using troigien, which means literally to crunch or gnaw. Yeah. It's typically used to describe the way animals, animals eat. Their Correct. Food. It's literally, it's, he changes the word from just eating like humans eat to like Disgusting. absolutely destroy and eat it. In a sense, so it's like, really it's like a passionate full effort. eating. Yes. Think disgusting. about think about like no, how passionate. how a it's hungry wolf like animals devours the flesh of a dead animal. Mm. It's like a passion it desperate apart. for yeah. that food. It's exactly. Like, oh, I guess I guess it's kind of speaking more about our our hunger, our absolute hunger for God. We're desperate yes. to receive Christ. Yeah. It's that kind of sense, you know, like a, In that like language. a hungry animal is desperate to find food and eat, or they die. You know, it's like Right. It's like that for us, we die without the Eucharist, spiritually. Exactly. That kind of reflects okay, so. our Lord's vulnerability as well in <clears throat> being in the Eucharist, like we're, we're punching on our Lord, you know. Well, you're not harming our Lord, you're not hurting Him, mm. because it's not His natural body, it's a sacramental presence under the forms of bread and wine. Uh, so you're not, you're not harming our Lord in any way. Unless you're in mortal sin. Well, yes, yes, of course, that offends God. But it doesn't harm him in himself. No, yeah, no one can harm. Him. No one can harm God. Well, it no offends one. God. Yeah, but that's it, what I mean. It breaks, it breaks his divine law. Yeah. yeah. 
but it doesn't do like no it's damage not, to like God. We can't damage Jesus him. By yeah. like Never. Him or something, you know, but but <laughs> it does offend God. It hurts yeah. his heart. Hmm. His love. He's offended, like how you are. If somebody hurts you, you laugh, you're offended, you feel hurt, you feel pain, you still love them, but you, you feel pain because you love them. You know? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, now that we've established that the word changes for eating to a passionate eating, we've seen how Jesus didn't just at this time when he realized all oh, the disciples are cut, they're seeing that, you know, this saying is a hard saying. He reiterates his saying and he says, no, you must do this. He doesn't compromise for anyone. And that's a real point of contention, a sticking point for us when we're trying to speak to anyone who doesn't think that the Lord meant to literally eat his body and blood, to literally consume it physically. Of course, again, the you, he does mean, come to me, I'll give you graces. I'm the, the bread of life, the food for souls. Just, but he meant it as well, literally to eat. Yeah, just curious, Joe, that the Protestants don't pick up on Jesus' veracity in that passage where he point blank and she changes the word literally and then really reiterates his statement. Goes up for I'm, Peter I'm being well. My flesh is like, you know, this is it. This mm. is it. Mm. He also does that for well, they Jews. Don't, they don't, they don't receive the Eucharist or have any well, Protestants. Well, 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 oh, no, I went to changes the actual name. He gave us Lebanese bread and juice. Yeah, well. Red juice, yeah. That's the Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> what did they say? They've like, done actual like exorcism wow. in front of me as well and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This was like last year. Was it? I I didn't have that much knowledge in the Bible, and like a year or two ago, and he was like my faith. Was that the Baptist Church in Croydon Park? Catholic, the Catholics go to hell and all that. That would yeah. be that would be deliverance because they're not authorized to have exorcism. No, they they, they, they genuinely say it's exorcism. Exorcism. That's this use of the work is only a true exorcism to be done in the Roman Catholic rite with the permission yeah. of a bishop. But apparently you fasted for twenty something. Wouldn't matter if they're still out of bounds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> At least he fasted. Good on him for that. <laughs> but yeah, um, going back to the passage. Even the 12 disciples, you can see, were offended. Why was this such a hard saying? We ever thought to ourselves, what's so hard about this saying? For us, it's easy here. Yeah, we just eat you, the most holy body, blood, soul, and of the Lord. That's it. We have no issue with it. What was such a big issue for these people? Have we ever thought about that? It was well, the breaking the Jewish law. Yes. In the Old Testament, you're forbidden to eat meat with the blood of the animal in it. So any consuming of blood is against the law. It's not kosher. Any single animal, you are not allowed to drink its blood. So when Jesus is talking about eating his flesh, cannibalism is forbidden. Drinking and eating blood is forbidden. All of these unclean things are yeah. forbidden. You can't eat a human. You can't eat a human being. So they're thinking, this guy is just tripping out. Again, they're so fleshly. Every week, it's like I say the same thing about the Jews. They're so stuck on the flesh. They're so stuck on the physical, tangible. They can't understand the, the supernatural. Their minds are so, unfortunately constricted that when Jesus when Jesus was Nicodemus, you must be born again. He says, can I go into my mother's womb? Like there's no room for the spiritual, the philosophical and the supernatural. They take it so purely physically and literally. That's they're right. As well, it's, but like they didn't have the grace of the Holy Spirit from Pentecost. Some of them had it. Some, some had it in different levels. Yeah, the Old Testament prophets had it. Some of them had it. Yeah, but it was a lot less. A lot less people had it than compared to today. You're baptized. You're a son of God. It's very dignified. So also, can we leave questions to the end so I can continue yeah, in all charity? Sure. <laughs> um, but the truth is the spirit was there. It was working. It's always working. But it was a lot less available than today. That's why Jesus said, it's better that I go, that if I go, I'll send you the comfort of the Holy Spirit. That This is like a bit of a little tangent, but we'll talk about the Holy Spirit. It's going to come up anyway in the coming weeks. <clears throat> but Peter's the funniest in this, what Peter says to the Lord. When Jesus says, will you go away also? And Peter said to him, Lord, who shall we go to? In other words, Peter saying, I've already thought about it, but where am I going to go? <laughs> I can't get anywhere else. I have to stay with you because you have the words of eternal life. Fulton Chi makes that point when he gives his commentary on this. It's like, you know, they're thinking, I'm going to leave. I can't believe this guy's saying this, but where else can we go? All of us. Who else can we go to? There's no one else. There's no other God. There's only one God. There's one Lord. We're stuck with Jesus, whether we like it or not. So we better get to know him. We better get to love him and go his way. 
Because it's either God or the devil. There's no in between. It's an improvement on making a golden calf. That's, sorry? It's an improvement on making a golden calf. Like yeah, oh, it is a big improvement, I guess. Yeah, well, at, you know, 100%. There is the true God, and the reality is there's no other God but Jesus, you know, in the Holy Trinity. So if we ever think, I'm just going to leave the Lord, I'm going to go find someone else. Remember Peter's words. Lord, to whom shall we go? Where else are we going to go? There's nowhere to go. There really is no other, there's no church. You can go in different rites. There's 24 um, rites in the Catholic Church. You don't have to be Roman Catholic. For some reason, whatever reason, we are allowed to change rites or Maronite. But you can't. But you can't go anywhere outside the Catholic Church if you know this is the place of salvation. So remember that. that. Bishop's approval. So you go speak to the priest. Question and answer time. (laughs) Yeah, like, I, I was confused. You have to stay Catholic pretty much. But you don't have to be Roman Catholic to go to heaven. There's 24 other Catholic churches. Traditions, basically. Uh, right. Um, so going back now to, to Judas. It's funny, Judas and Simon are always very closely paralleled. Both betrayed the Lord. Both Peter betrayed Jesus in saying, I don't know you. But and Judas betrayed Jesus in delivering up to the Jews. <coughs> Peter is always the first when you read the chronology of the Apostles. They list him first for his primacy. And Judas is always last. Because he betrayed. If you read it, it's actually crazy. And I think like six or seven times. Peter's name is first in the order. And Judas is always last. Judas is Iscariot. They're always paralleled with each other. And we see here Peter's faith deepening. Lord, I'm not going anywhere except you. Because you have the words of life. And we see Judas. Yet one of you is a devil. For he spoke of Judas Iscariot. One of the twelve who was to betray him. Because in his heart, this is the place where he said... Maybe this guy is just not 100% about the Lord, unfortunately. This is where his heart slowly veered to the left. Judas was in charge of the money. He was the treasurer of the, um, the 12. And even in the scriptures, it says that he used to steal from that money. So Judas has, unfortunately, a long history of making bad decisions and bad choices. And this is where it starts in the scriptures. So it's just for us to reflect upon. But that was John chapter 6 in a nutshell. Um, I will open up to a bit of questions before we go to seven, just so we don't lose the fruit, if there are any questions. Yeah. Does it just list his steals in the next scriptures? Yeah, it does. Just with the Marimar. 60? Huh? We're finished with chapter six. So just with the Marimar. Just finish. Okay. Yeah. Say, like, I want to be Roman Catholic because like, I'm not really Marimar. Yes. Do I have to go to the Bishop, Marimar Bishop? You don't have to go physically. You just can write him a letter or an email and just say, um, I feel called to the Roman Catholic Church. You get your parish priest to be CC'd or to say, I've spoken to my parish priest. I'd like to embrace the Roman Catholic Church. And then our bishop, the Maronite bishop, will approve. And then you'll say to Fisher, the bishop of the Romans in Sydney, um, I have have approval to change rights canonically. And then you Amen. simple as that. Like a spiritual passport. Yeah, yeah pretty much. Something like that. But you just need, you need bishops approval. We shouldn't be doing it just like that. But if you do feel called genuinely... Um, you don't there's have to nothing wrong. You can just go to any Catholic church anyway. You could, but you're bound by your canon law. So you're bound <laughs> to fast the Maronite sure. way. Yeah. You oh, have like, to yeah, fast the Maronite way. Uh, <laughs> you're bound under the Maronite church's law. So what's the Maronite fast? Midday to midnight, and no meat, no dairy, first and last week of Lent, for Lent, and then every Friday of Lent, no meat, and I think um, that's the current Maronite fasting. And Saturday and Sunday, you're not supposed to fast or abstain in those Saturday days. Saturday and Sunday. Yes, because the Council of Nicaea in the, one of the canons. 380. Um, 380 so they decreed that in honor of the Sabbath, we shouldn't be fasting because the Sabbath is still, we revere the Sabbath, not like Sunday, but we revere it in a sense God rested on the Sabbath. That's why we don't fast on the Sabbath. So you should, like, these are the things every Maronite should know and should do. Uh, but, you know, FYI, that's all. Most people don't even know, but that's all right. Yeah, but my mum's Maronite and my dad's Roman Catholic. You're Roman Catholic, no, no. You're Roman Catholic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you're, it's a lot easier. It's a lot easier. Because of my dad. Because of your dad. Your dad Lebanese as well? Yeah. But he's Roman. Hmm. Okay. That's interesting. Yeah, he was mm. born in Lebanon as well. Yeah. Lebanon, in Lebanon's got like mix, like. Mm. Yeah, there are, 50, 50. There, there are Roman Catholics in there. Yeah. They are, they are Maronites yeah. as well. I think there are some Dolphites there too. Yeah. A few, yeah. Lebanon's got a few, but now there's. I've gone to Maronite church. If your dad was Maronite, technically he's still Maronite, even though he doesn't realize. But 
I don't know if he the was. Tech, yeah, if he wasn't, like then... Historically, because it comes yeah. from the father. It yeah. comes down from the father. So even if, even if I baptised a Lebanese child and the father was Maronite, the child would still be Maronite. Technically, yeah. Yeah, technically. But yeah, there's a lot of these little intricacies. Um, but we strive to learn them in simplicity, not to you know overcomplicate them or to make them any harder than they need to be. This was like how, how much are you bound to do the Maronite fasting? Because I'm not kind of doing the Roman fasting, two small meals, one big meal. Because you're under the canon law of the Maronite, the Eastern Catholic churches, you're bound by that, that canon law. So you're bound by the law of the church. What so it's simple as that. It is, it is, of course, but it depends on the gravity. We can't say gravity. Speak to probably a Maronite priest. Something for you to think about now that you know. Because if, if you don't have full knowledge, you can't do a mortal sin. Um, but so it's actually bound by a sin to not follow them. Yeah, but to not follow your canons, it is okay. binding. But now you know, so something for you to look at. And God will give you the grace, so don't be, don't worry. Okay. That's it. But I just want to emphasize again what a dramatic turning point chapter 6 of St. John's Gospel is for our Lord and for the disciples. Imagine how our Lord felt when it says many of his disciples no longer went with him. So there was this massive turning away from our Lord. The twelve remained with him, but maybe somewhat reluctantly. Like, it's better we stay with our Lord than go away with this crowd. But it's a real turning point. It's when the teaching of our Lord got difficult, challenging. You know, it wasn't just wonderful signs anymore. There was actually doctrine behind it. And the doctrine was the thing that they, they um, struggled with. So at one point they had 72, didn't they? Yeah. They were the appointed later. This is a large crowd of people. This isn't the specific no, 72. About the it, call, doesn't, call sort of, it doesn't say the number of the greater, the greater number of disciples. It doesn't mean the 12. No. But they found the teaching too, too hard to accept. And I guess if we're trying to understand why, which Ali was talking about how the Jews were very external sure. in the practice of their faith and following the law... You know, uh, um, the scribes and Pharisees, I think there were 613 Please. laws. Did they follow those daily, John? They were their laws, yeah, grew in their tradition. So very external. Um, but we might, we, might, we might look at it, as, as I said before, as a Protestant might look at Catholic theology. It's just too, it's too, it's too hard for them to accept. Yeah. It's a radical... Yeah, it's a radical thing, a misunderstanding as well. Yeah. So it's ignorance, but, but a hardness mm. too, you know. So they just couldn't accept that teaching. And so it was a real... But notice our Lord did not run after them. No. He didn't compromise his teaching. Oh, I was only joking. Come back, come back. Yeah, you know? exactly. He didn't do that. So he really stuck to his guns. And it was either, it was either all or nothing. I was just thinking, Joe mentioned the fact that Judas really didn't accept the doctrine of the real presence no. of our Lord. No, well, Judas was also, he had an agenda. Yeah. As many of, many of the Jews were looking to some kind of political Messiah who would banish the Romans. And what was the mountain he was going to be crowned on? John? Remember the Messiah who was going to be crowned on some mountain? Or In Jerusalem, you mean? I forgot the name of it. Anyway. Simon. Yeah, Robert had that. Yeah. Um, so... Yeah, they, they were just look. They were they were on a different wavelength. So that's what made made it so easy easily for him on that Thursday night to, to yes. consume yeah. our Lord not reverently. Yeah, yes, yeah. He knew what he was doing. It was a sacrilegious communion, but still he was ordained that night. That's right. What you So he was the first priest to, you know. Mm. So the 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 tradition is the apostles were ordained were ordained. As bishops, yeah. still priests, but yeah. bishops, the fullness of the priesthood at the Last Supper. And Judas, yeah, we know how Judas ended up. Unfortunately. So he, he, didn't, he didn't believe in the Eucharist. He, he just couldn't accept it. And on that note, it's just to continue on our tangent, just slightly. That gift that Jesus gave Judas, the gift of um, being a bishop, the gift of the episcopate, the gift of his own body and blood. He makes that gift available to us. And he asks us, if you desire, come. Judas came and he ended up wrong in the wrong end because he chose 
to do evil things with the gifts he was given. Everyone to God, God everyone gives everyone gifts. Sorry, God gives everyone gifts. He gives you three talents. He gives you five. Maybe he gives me one talent. Um, Judas had a great talent, great gift, the gift of being a bishop, the gift of receiving the body of Christ. In my opinion, the greatest gift, the gift of being with three years with Jesus, seeing Jesus for three years, seeing his miracles, talking literally to Jesus, to God in the flesh, seeing the miracles, listening to the most greatest preaching ever, the greatest philosopher, the greatest speaker, and he heard him. His own lips saw his own eyes. That's And I believe he had such a great gift, and yet... Look what he done with that gift. Now he wasted it. It's just it's sobering for us to realize how much we need God and how much we need to be humble. Um, the great One of the greatest sins of Judas, obviously the greatest would have been his pride. Uh, being able to stand in the face of God and yet see nothing. Not see him for what he really was. So any gift that we have, anything that we think God has given us as a talent, we should use it well. And that's a real... A real point for us to take home. Um, any other questions before we jump into chapter 7? Um, so it talks about the body, like you must eat my flesh, but he doesn't talk about the blood, does he? Like he doesn't command that. Yes, so in the last supper he commands, do this in memory of me, and he says the word, like so he tells, tells us to do it, to eat and drink of the chalice. So why aren't we drinking? The in the church. Very good question. Why don't we drink of the chalice of the church? We used to drink of the chalice in the church um, up until the Middle Ages, around the time of the plague, um, for safety and health reasons, so we wouldn't pass around the plague. It's very historical, actually. Um, it was for health purposes, so that um, just to present. Yeah, well, the plague was very serious, and if you both eat from the same cup, you know, you don't want to catch the plague. So then, the main thing is. As long as the priests receive, so when the priests receive on the altar, they receive for the congregation. That's that's why every mass the priest receives. Oh, so that's how it works now. Um, but we can still receive. We're still allowed. Some parishes not during COVID, but Saint Joseph's Camberdown, you receive of the chalice. Um, it's a more fuller representation. The Catechism says so. It's a more fuller depiction of the Last Supper to receive the chalice. Um, but most parishes don't do it for many reasons. One is You'd need like 10 chalices if you have a big parish and everyone has to drink. Um, yeah, we heard that St. John Vianney. St. John yeah. So some parishes still do do yeah. it. Maybe not now because of COVID. Yeah. Do we um, do it once a year at least? Or? Probably. Hmm? Do we do it once a year at least? Or? What's that? Drink the blood of Jesus? No, no. not in this parish. Oh, okay. You've got to remember that if you receive the body of Christ, you also receive the blood of Christ. It's one sacrament. Okay. Yeah, because actually, nice. basically, the way I've heard it is that, like the obviously before consecration, the bread and the wine. Obviously, visually, you would connect the bread to being after consecration, the body of Christ, Christ and the, the wine is blood. But they're both you know how, the body, blood, yeah, soul, and divinity. It's actually Christ, turned into a physical heart. And the, re- the reason why and I don't offer it blood, here is yeah. because Definitely. it's hard to do it reverently and safely. Yeah. And secondly, I've been in parishes where people develop heretical thinking, whereby they think if they don't receive both, they haven't been to communion. That's that's a heresy. So it's one sacrament. To receive the body is to receive the blood. And in some cases, I've had parishioners in other parishes who couldn't receive normal a normal host, so they'd either either receive a gluten low gluten host, or they just have a drop of the precious blood. Mm. In that, okay, case, in that case, I might consider offering it to someone, but in usual practice, I've found it's been a lot more trouble than it's worth. It, it can, it's hard to do it reverently in terms of spillage and, and, and also health too. People. And the church has spoken about all those things yeah. you just listed. But they mentioned all, those listed as well. There's, many, there's other reasons. I've had people who become very prideful concerning the Eucharist. Like there was one parish and the, the bishop said, you can't give the precious blood. There was a there was some disease going around at the time and he demanded, he demanded it. I'm going to come up and demand to receive it and I just thought, you know, this practice has done you no good. So that's why I don't do it here. But it's, it's, this is just a very traditional parish. It was never, was never in the Roman Rite offered, offered in the liturgy. Fair enough. But it can be offered also by intention. Where the host is dipped in the precious yeah. blood and placed on the tongue of the faithful, but then you don't, 
you find people who don't want to receive on the tongue. So, I remember a Maronite priest that I was serving. That's the Maronite way. That it's the intention. That's how the Maronites do the Eucharist. Because people it must be on the tongue yeah. there when you do that. Yeah. And some people were still trying to put yeah. their hands out to receive it every single time. Yeah. Like I would hear him tell them off, on your tongue, on your tongue, on your tongue, on your yeah, tongue, no, no yeah. hands. So it's, it just be, it becomes a distraction then. It, it yeah, creates... So you can't grab it with your hand. No, because you've no. got the precious it's blood. Where it's where the host... It's got the precious blood in it. It's it gets on your hands. Problem. You can't do that. It has to go straight on your tongue. Okay, the old church I went to, I hold my hand up. Well, oh, I, I mean, you you have to ordinarily you might be able to receive in the hand, but intention... Means it's when they get you, they dip it take, in the take, blood and it's like a wet host. Oh, the wet host. It's like the yeah, marinades. Yeah, yeah. The marinades do like that. The precious blood. You must place it on their tongue. Mm. So I just I found in parishes that one it can create an erroneous thinking around the Eucharist where people think that if they haven't received both, they haven't been to communion, that they get demanding about it too. Like you know they think it's their right. It's, we don't have a right to the blessed sacrament. It's a gift of God. You know, it's a privilege to receive the Blessed Sacrament, but we don't have a right to it. Um, and it becomes, like practically speaking, hard to manage that. that um, and then you have, you know, you need a million people traipsing all over the altar, and it just becomes a nightmare. So that's why. Does that sort of explain it? There's a lot of reasons. Um, but then I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, um, but then oh. I'm not running down priests who <laughs> offer the precious blood to people by any means. It's so a good, it's actually a good thing. I, it's, I just found it is a good difficult thing. practice for those reasons. You're it's right. not, it's um, not something you have to offer. Um, you can, but I've just found it a difficult practice for those reasons. So that's why I find it easier. You're right. Though, just to go with the blessed sacrament. That. that would be a real. Yeah, problem. it happens. It happens, mm. and yeah. Anyway. Anyway, Can I make a bit more sense? Yeah, it made sense. Made sense. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not trying to run anyone down. So it is a good thing, um, but the church spoke about it because they approached everything that Father Benjamin just listed. The church actually discussed this, which you can look up when you get home. Um, the church councils they actually talk about it, especially around the time of the plague at the 1400s. Church book or something? Like catechism. Heaps. 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 Yeah. Okay. Definitely. Have you seen the Catechism of the Catholic Church before? No. I've got a copy, two copies of it. On, it's online for free. If you type in Google Catechism of the Catholic Church, there's a Vatican website. All the documents of the Church are available on there for free, including the whole Catechism. Yeah, yeah. Is that like West Catechism? On the website as well, on the Vatican the website. Catechism is, is a... Is there a book? What's that? Of course, by the huge... Uh, it was put theories. together yeah. by... Cardinal Ratzinger, who became Benedict XVI, right. and Pope John Paul II in the 1990s. See, oh, okay. the Church issues a catechism. It's an official publication of the Vatican that sets out the basic principles of the Catholic faith on a, on a number of topics. The Creed, the Our Father, prayer, the sacraments. So the previous catechism to that came out about 400 years previous. That was the Catechism of the Council of Trent. So catechisms don't come out all the time. You know, it's every few hundred years or as needed. So the most recent one was in 1994, I think it was. Yeah, so they and, change it every now and then. Well, the, well it's, it's, not it's, changing, it's not changing the faith, obviously. It's just explaining it in a different way, in a more contemporary way, so that it's, it's easier for us to learn the faith. So to modernise it a little bit. Well, uh, more no, more no, no just you've got to be careful with the word modernisation because in yeah. modern, modern, modern terms that means to change, to update. Yeah, yeah. We never can do that with the faith. The faith is unchanging, it's perennial. But what we do is we find a, 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 a clearer, a clearer, more acceptable way of teaching the faith in every age. The okay. same faith, the same unchanging yeah. faith. Okay. But equally, equally, the Catechism of the Council of Trent is also a really beautiful read as well. So it's it's just the previous catechism to the modern one, but it's very beautiful. I've got a copy of it in there. And what about the Latin? Is it does the Latin language stay the same? Latin yes. prayers and yes. okay. Yeah, they do. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. They're ancient from antiquity. Oh, so yeah. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. Good question, Dan. Good, good ask. Um, we'll continue on John chapter 7 from verse 1, if you want to bring out your Bibles or listen. Yeah. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. 
After this, Jesus went about in Galilee. He would not go about in Judea because the Jews sought to kill him. So again, Jesus was just in Judea and now he's leaving the area of the Jews going to Galilee where it's a lot more diverse, a lot more pagan. Now the feast of the tabernacles was at hand. So his brothers said to him, Leave here and go to Judea, that your disciples may see your works you are doing. For no man works in secret if he wants to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. So why are the disciples going down to, to Jerusalem, to Judea, the area? The Feast of Tabernacles. Remember I said one of the three obligatory feasts, Tabernacles, Unleavened Bread. They're all happening at the same time. Unleavened Bread just happened. The Feast of um, the Passover, they celebrate that. The Feast of Tabernacles, they remember what? The, tab the, the law, the tablets that God gave Moses. It's all in the same time period, I think. I tried to explain a bit of it. So the feast is still going on. So there's a bit of a break, then another feast. Then it's, this is a week-long feast. Uh, and then the next one, I think, is Pentecost. So these, like we have um, Christmas, we have Easter, we have Pentecost as well. Jews had that sort of thing going on as well. Except they had to go to Jerusalem, the men of the age. So that's why they're saying, you're going to come to the feast. So we continue. For even his brothers did not believe in him. Jesus said to them, my time has not yet come, but your time is always here. The world cannot hate you, but it hates me, because I testify of it that its works are evil. Go to the feast yourselves. I am not coming up to this feast, for my time has not yet fully come. And so saying, he remained in Galilee. Why did Jesus' disciples respond to him in that way? They said to him, when he's saying, I don't want to go, they're saying to him, why don't you come? No one does all these miracles in secret. Come and reveal yourself. And it says it's, they didn't fully believe at that time. Again, Jesus gave this big sermon about you have to eat my body and blood. And they were a bit shaken up. And it's, you can see how shaken up they were. In a sense, they're answering back to Jesus. Why aren't you coming back to show yourself to the world? They don't understand that Jesus is working his three-year ministry. They think it's a you know, one-year, one-week, one-day ministry. He's building up, he's teaching them, he's leading them, and for that he needs time. All good things come with time, right? Um, and his disciples are becoming impatient. So this is just a practical into the what's happening, why is it happening um, with the disciples. Because they were men too. They're like all men. We want things to happen now. Jesus is here. Let's go reveal yourself to everyone. Go and become king. Let's go and conquer the world. But Jesus is saying, be patient. My time is not yet. The crucifixion is not yet. That's what we derive from that. Why is he saying the world cannot hate you, but he hates me? Where the world, yes, this is the spiritual, very, very spiritual language. Have you, in the beginning of John, it says Jesus came into the world, but they received him not. They loved darkness. It says because their deeds were evil. So people do evil things. People, people watch pornography or they do evil things. They don't want everyone to know. You don't go up to a parent and say, oh, I just watched pornography. Oh, I just done X, Y, and Z. Oh yeah, you don't do that. No one does that because no. you want to do it in the dark. Yeah. But Jesus is saying, I am the light. He's saying, Ev I'm here to expose all darkness. And what do people get? They get triggered. Oh, why are you saying that? Why are you doing that? <laughs> people get triggered. That's why they hate Jesus. That's why he says to them, the world hates me he's because he's the truth. What does every liar hate? They hate the truth. They can't stand the truth of themselves. But he says the world cannot hate you. The world doesn't hate them because he, he's soul. I actually have a little commentary on that. The world, the family of sinful men, the relatives of Jesus are still part of the world because they are not hated by it as he is. Jesus isn't there for any purpose except God's will. He's not there to compromise. He's not there to meet anyone in a way that is unfaithful to the Father. So Jesus' sole purpose is God, and the disciples weren't at that stage yet. That's why he's saying that. We know after Pentecost, they got, got mur murdered, they got massacred, they got martyred, they got everything, they got courage to yeah. stand up for what they believe. What this is really saying is the disciples aren't true disciples. That's what it really is saying. Oh, okay. That they don't hate sense. you like me because I'm 100% believing, but you guys are still not there. Oh, That's really what it's saying. Yeah. I guess the word could be used, they don't hate you yet. <laughs> yeah, that's right, they don't hate you but they will yet, hate you. but they will hate you, exactly. Yeah, Jesus, that's yeah, right. Jesus said, the world hates you, no, it hates me. And that's exactly right. It continues, yeah. it's, see, the scriptures are beautiful, but to understand this verse, you need to understand the scriptures, like everything links to everything. 
There's that's the one. gift, you know, that's the beauty. There's another one where he says, um, if they persecute me, they'll persecute you. Or yes. Me, they, they if they've done this to the, you know, to the master of the house, what will they do? Like to the others. Yeah. So if you believe me, this is, this is what's going to happen they to you. take up your cross daily and... My burden is easy, my is You're mashing it up a bit, but Yana, you're, you're yeah, saying the right thing. Do it. But that's the point. The point is, you know, I'm here to answer, but you will be here soon. You'll get to that level soon, but they're not there yet. Obviously, because of how they're answering Jesus and they're provoking him to go do more miracles. Even his disciples, as we learned from previously, they didn't even believe when he said it, uh, when he spoke about eating his body and blood. They were doubting as well. Again, it's a really big saying, like, you know, as Father said, it's a big thing. When you're not allowed to eat, like so many animals as a Jew, you're not allowed to eat pig, you're not allowed to eat camel, you're not allowed to eat um, a gnat, which is like a little, little animal. You're not allowed to eat shellfish. There's all these things you can't do and can't eat. You can't be a cannibal, you can't drink blood. Like, the list goes on and on and on and on. And for someone to say, you have to eat my blood, like, eat my flesh, and later say, drink my blood. It's like, anyway. Go on, go on, go on. Yeah, it's crazy. <laughs> so continuing now, we're on verse 10. After this, his brothers had gone up to the feast. Then he also went up, not publicly, but in private. So Jesus at that time when they said, come, didn't want to go. He said, my time is not yet. But then after they go, he comes up secretly. So this is again very interesting. The Lord said he doesn't want to go at that time. But then a little while after they left, he does go. So now the game's on. The big thing is about to happen. You know, something's going to happen. Obviously, when the Lord goes to the Jerusalem area, he always confronts the same two people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, the officials, the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin is like the magisterium. The Jewish magisterium that we have is called the Sanhedrin. So anytime you hear Jesus is going into Jerusalem, something big's happening. He's going to get, you know, persecutors, going to get everything, everything. It usually happens there, the big, big things. The Jews were looking for him at the feast and saying, where is he? And there was much muttering about him among the people. While some said, he's a good man. Others said, no, he's leading the people astray. Yet for fear of the Jews, no one spoke openly of him. Yet for the love of men, no one spoke because people loved to be liked. They're not going to say to someone, you need to repent. You're believing evil things. They're going to say, oh, you're, you're doing, doing all right. Good. You're doing good things. Just keep going. It's all right. God will forgive you. They were gossiping. You know, they were gossiping. They were, but what they, you know, we're gossiping. That's right, actually. Yeah. But they weren't willing to say, I believe in you, Jesus. They were too scared. When we see, we see someone doing something wrong, and we have it in our power to do something and we say, oh, I'm not going to do anything, let that happen. That's an injustice. And we see, unfortunately, again, Jesus says, he who loves the world does not have love for God. You can't love the world and love God. What does that translate to? If you see an injustice, if you say vote yes for abortion and you actually vote yes, no, you're, you're not supposed to do that. You're supposed to not go with the world, not compromise. And if the, everyone hates Jesus... You don't not say nothing and say, oh yeah, I hate Jesus too. You do something about it. And that's what these people fail to do. Can we get to end questions? Mm -hmm. About the middle of the feast, Jesus went into the temple and taught. See how daring Jesus is. He literally went into the temple, the epitome of salvation, the culmination where God meets man. The most holy place in the universe to the Jews. It represents the Garden of Eden. It represents heaven. It represents everything they find sacred. And Jesus knows they're all triggered at him. And yet he goes and he preaches. You see, Jesus was very courageous. He was very, very courageous. The Jews marveled at it, saying, How is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So back in Jewish times, I know now we have education, free education for many people, and it is a great blessing. But in Jesus' times and for much of after Jesus' times, education wasn't just given to people. Education had to be bought for a very expensive price. Or someone would have to tutor you. So in this case, the, of the rabbis, you know, there's the school of Hillel, the school of Gamaliel, the two great schools. We don't need to know all this generally, but there was two competing ideas. Sort of like we have Thomas, Tom, Thomas, and some people believe in like Augustine. They hold, even though they're slightly different, they'll argue this guy's better or this guy's theology is better. They had that as well in the Jews. So that Pharisee or the head rabbi 
would teach them and they'd be part of their school. But no one taught Jesus. He had no formal training. So they're, like, they're tripping out. How is it this man has learning when he has never studied? It's a valid question. How does he know all these things if no one's ever taught him? So Jesus answered them, My teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If any man's will is to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I am speaking of my own authority. He who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But he who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. This is a very beautiful saying. So I'm going to stop Jesus halfway in his speech and just help break down what he's saying. My teaching is not mine. In the Catechism it says God spoke but one word in all eternity and that word was Jesus. Jesus is literally the words of God. He is the word, the one single word of God. The whole scripture talks about one person, Jesus, who is the word of God. This is now, I'm getting very theological. Everything relates to Christ. Every virtue, every good thing, every beautiful thing in the world speaks about God and it relates to God. And just as it does, that's why Jesus is saying his teaching is not his in a sense of his humanity in, the, in his hypostatic union. His teaching is God's teaching. I'm here to present God to you. He says, he's who sent me. If any man, and next, if any man's will is to do his will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking of my own authority. AKA, like he's saying things that are not from God. That's what he's saying. He says, if you do God's will, this is also one of my favorite verses, John 7, 17. If you want to know if thing is from God or not, do God's will and God will move your heart. This is a very good principle. It, it's a little bit detached from this as its own principle. If you want to know God's will, if you want to know, is this person a good person? Is this person not a good person? By their fruits, you live a good life. You do God's will and you'll have the spiritual eyes to see. That's what Jesus is saying. If you live in God's grace, then you have spiritual eyes to see things. In essence, that's what this means. He who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. That's pretty self-explanatory. But sometimes it's not that plain, so I'll speak about it anyway. If someone comes up to you and starts talking about things and tries to make themselves look smart, they're seeking their own glory. They're speaking pretty much, you know, I'll say in a bit more respectful term, like just they're speaking from their head. They just yeah, they just want to seek their own pride. They want to seek their own like gratification. But if you seek to glorify Him who sent you, as in AK, you want to glorify God. That's how we get merit. That's how we don't go into pride. We're seeking to glorify God. That's what he's saying he's doing. Now we continue. Did not Moses give you the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. This is like, like a, a, a big bit, trigger. Yeah. Oh, sorry. But he who seeks his glory of him who sent him is true. And in him there is no falsehood. Again, reiterating. Jesus is there for God. Did not Moses give the law? Yet none of you keeps the law. Why do you seek to kill me? Every time he goes into Jerusalem, just think something's going to happen. He walks into the temple, the most holy place, and he literally drops it. Why don't you keep the law? Imagine that someone tells you, you're not a real Christian. You're a heretic. That's what he just told them. You're not, you're not a real Jew. Then he says, why, do you try to, why are you trying to kill me? Why do you seek to kill me? Imagine that. What do you mean? I'm trying to kill you? Oh, the, that, the things Jesus says sometimes. He says, the people answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? So now they say he's got a demon. Jesus answered, I did one deed and you marveled at it. Jesus done healings in Jerusalem. And they're marveling. Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man upon the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, yet you are angry with me because of the Sabbath I made a whole man's body whole. Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. He's killing Boom. Him. He's killing him. Boom. That was like left, right, uppercut, what? Hand, So let's take this hands. down and now help us understand what's actually being said. That was an absolute verse. That was better than economy. Jesus says to them, you guys are not following the law. They get triggered. They say, you have a demon. Who's trying to kill you? All of the Jews, the actual authorities are trying to kill Jesus. FYI. They hate him. Why? Earlier on in, in this area, what does he do? He heals the man. He heals a man whose whole body. So let me get the exact 
um, healing miracle that is happening right here. Is that the one get up and walk? I did, I did one deed. Oh. Let me just double check so I'd say the right thing for oh. you. The healing of the okay, it was the lame man. So the man who was on his mat in the book in the uh, the movie the, the Chosen yeah. when they do the TV series. Is it the, what, the water? The, yeah, yeah, in the yeah, pool yeah, of yeah. Siloam. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's the water. So that miracle. Oh, yeah, yeah. So this guy was disabled, couldn't walk, been there for like thirty plus years. Jesus says, "Get up and walk and carry your mat." So they're fuming that they made this guy carry his mat yeah. on the Sabbath. That's why they're so cut. How dare you do a miracle on, on the Sabbath? How dare you tell him to pick up his mat and walk? But they forget that it's actually a miracle. And then what does Jesus tell them? He says, you gave, Moses gave you circumcision. Not that it's from Moses, but the fathers. So circumcision didn't come from Moses. It actually came from Abraham. God told Abraham, circumcise. And Moses inherited that in his covenant. And yet, if the eighth day falls on the Sabbath, so according to the law of Abraham, you can say, on the eighth day after the child is born, they had to be circumcised. Funny enough, the body actually produces the most white cells platelets on that day. So it corresponds to science. So that's like a little, a little good thing in the Bible. So that bleed less? Or... On the eighth day, your blood yeah. clots faster. So not bleed less, but your clot better. Okay. Um, but they do the circumcision, even if it's on the Sabbath. They don't say, oh, it's a Sabbath, we can't do any work, we can't circumcise. No, the circumcision supersedes the need to rest on the Sabbath. So Jesus is using what, that what literary that? argument because it's a greater thing. It's a greater, greater love. It's, a, it's like there's a good and then there's different levels of the good. But that's a, like another whole, but that's a quick answer. Yeah. Ask me a question and answer and I'll talk more about it. So Jesus is saying, so that the law of Moses may not be broken, Yet you are angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well. These people are the biggest hypocrites. They'll circumcise so that they fulfill the law of Moses. But if Jesus wants to cleanse and restore the whole person's body, they're fuming and they're losing it. Wow. That's what he's saying to them. You're such a hypocrite. You do the little things. You do a little circumcision and you think that's fine. But if I heal someone and bring them to God, you think that's the worst thing in the world. Then he says... Do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. He's telling them, stop being so superficial and thinking everything's evil when everything's not evil. That's in essence what he's saying. And again, you hear the famous verse in Matthew 5, you know, judge not least ye be judged. Well, Jesus says right here, do not judge by appearances, but judge with right judgment. We all need a judge. Every one of us need a judge. Because if we don't judge, we'll just do whatever and think not everything's all right. When there is a difference between moral evil and moral good, and we're all called to judge with right judgment. See, the Jews judged Jesus for healing that man who was on sickbed for like 30 years as an evildoer. Was that the right judgment? Of course not. You judge the action, but not the soul. So you're right? talking more in judgment. Well, yes, we're judging the action. The action of healing on the Sabbath, they judge that to be evil. Whereas if a camel falls, you know, sorry, not a camel, they give the example of a donkey, he falls into a pit, wouldn't they take it up on the Sabbath? Or if someone needs to be circumcised on the Sabbath, wouldn't they do it? Yes, they would. And then he says, the Sabbath is for man, not man for the Sabbath. You don't go to the Sabbath like, oh, I can't do nothing, can't do nothing. You're supposed to live in joy and peace. In Jesus of Nazareth, um, I know it's like a bit scripted and everything, but the essence was the Pharisees both, well, we, you know, like Jesus said, you know, if you had an animal stuck in a pit, wouldn't you get it out? And, and they say, yeah, we know all that, we know all that, but isn't it, you know, hard for the common people to understand that? You know, it's almost like, yeah, yeah we get it, the subtlety of thought, but the common people, you know, it's lost that. on them, you know. Yeah. Because they don't have the teaching exactly that the higher people do. Yeah, exactly. They were just saying, like, the, the, the common people down below won't get the subtlety of thought that you were trying to... You know, um, communicate the reality us. is the Holy Spirit is the only teacher. When people speak, like for example, Father Benjamin could speak to 100 people, God could not give them the grace to understand. Maybe only one person understands, or maybe all 100 understand. The person who's giving the speech, their job isn't to give people the grace, that's God's job. This is again going on the topic of grace, but going on what you're saying, it doesn't matter how simple someone is. God can still make that person have a better understanding than even the greatest theologian. 
I think they, the Pharisees did that as a protection mechanism for themselves. Of course, in that example, they're just trying to say yeah. things to make yeah. to justify themselves. Exactly. Um, but thanks for bringing that up, David. So we're still in the heat of the moment. We're continuing now in this big exchange. And some of the people of Jerusalem therefore said, Is not this man whom they seek to kill? And here he is speaking openly, and they say nothing to him. Can it be that the authorities really know that this is the Christ? Yet we know where this man comes from. And when the Christ appears, no one will know where he comes from. So what does that mean? In the Old Testament, in that time, there were the traditions that the, one, there was two schools that the Christ wouldn't be manifest until he was um, doing his public ministry, which actually came true because Jesus didn't manifest himself as he was at the wedding of Cana. And there was another that he would be born of a woman, as we know from Isaiah, and he'll come into the world that way a virgin shall conceive. The, good, the amazing thing is that Christ fulfills both. He comes as an infant, but he doesn't reveal himself until he is of age, at the age of 30. That's why they're confused. We know where he comes from. This guy is born, some say, in, um, in Nazareth. Even though he was born in Bethlehem, he grew up in Nazareth. It's funny how Jesus fulfills all the prophecies, like to the T. He's like, he's born in Bethlehem, because the prophecy says that's where he'd come from. Then he says he comes from Nazareth, which is where he grew up. Nazareth meaning um, like the branch, branch town, Stumpton, directly translates to, as in he's from the, the branch of David which is where that tribe actually is, city of David. I'm saying a lot of different theological things. But he fulfills everything. Didn't they say in the scriptures he will be called a Nazarene? Yes, but he actually but never they, says that they, in the Old they Testament. they don't know where he comes from in the sense that they, they don't know his divine origin. Yes. Right. So that, Again, that's, yes. Uh, that's, I mean, you know, Christ our Lord says you do not, he actually said that, you do not know where I come from. Where do you come from? Where do you go? Where do you come from? Yeah, and so they, so they physically, yes, as a man, they, and again, you see their, their concern about the outward kind of fleshly thing. Again, they forget the spiritual significance. He's, really, it's relating to his divine origin. We don't know heaven. We don't know, what that, we don't know where he comes from in that sense. So we yeah. don't actually know heaven by experience. But here's the Pharisees, even when he fulfills the prophecy, they, they say he, he premeditates his actions to correspond with prophecy. So he's Haters like will, you know, trying to mirror prophecy by his actions. He can't um, do you know, okay, on that, I think it's time to finish, yeah. Jared, but... wrapping that up, on, minutes, on that last point, the Pharisees at that time in Jesus' history, again, they were everyone was hot waiting for the Messiah. I spoke about Daniel, how we, I keep going back to Daniel, the vision of the huge sculpture and they had four materials and the bottom was represented to the Roman materials and they knew at that time the Messiah would come with rock and destroy and then his kingdom would be established. That's what they're all waiting for. They know that the Romans are that kingdom. They're burning and waiting for the Messiah because they know through prophecy this is the period. They were actually, um, in the scriptures it even talks about and Josephus the historian says many false prophets arise claiming to be the Messiah. Many claim to be the Messiah. Thutis, in Acts 15, uh, sorry, not Acts 15, when Stephen goes before the Sanhedrin in the book of Acts, um, the response from, I think it was Gamaliel, he says that many came before, at least Thutis, I think it a guy named Judas, who came as false messiahs, and they were crushed and defeated by the Romans. So a lot of people had been coming up claiming to be the Messiah. So I give credit to the Pharisees in a sense they were very sceptical because there were a lot of fake messiahs at that time, which we haven't talked about before. I know this is probably new information for a lot of you. But on that note, the Pharisees aren't all bad. Um, so we shouldn't always put them down. I feel like that's something we can do. They did have a lot of merits. They love the scriptures. They love to meditate on God. They genuinely thought they were doing the right thing. They had good intentions. And it says as well that not a f but a few believed so they did believe, but they just didn't have the courage to speak. So, I have to commend them on their fashion sense. Very their fashion? Great. Fashion sense. They always pick the nice garments. <laughs> <laughs> no, yeah, thanks, I David. Mean... <laughs> but on that note, on a good note, uh, in fairness to the Pharisees, because some of them were very good, um, we'll conclude this Bible studies in concluding prayer. Father Benson, I ask you to lead. Okay. All right. Stand up. Father, Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit, amen. amen. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. The Lord be with you. I will mighty God bless you, Father, and Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now, just before we go to Comp Line, for those who are coming, 